You know, there are those times when I will hear a song that will just freeze me in the presence of the Lord. Mostly songs of worship and especially songs of thanksgiving because he has been so good to me. And I know you're saying the same thing out there. This song by Brother Nathaniel Bassey just blessed me to my soul. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we waited for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. Oh, hallelujah to his name. He's an awesome God tonight. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we've waited for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. You know, when I look back over my life and I think about the times there were valley situations, but I reflect and see how God brought me out. Oh, he is definitely a God of deliverance. Trust in him with all of your heart tonight. Mm -hmm. See what? The Lord has done. God, we bless your name tonight. I'm reminded right now, in the New Testament, there was the priest, and his name was Zacharias, and his wife, Elizabeth. And they had believed you, Lord, for many years for a child. Now they were of old age, and there was absolutely no way in the natural they would produce a child. But one day as Zacharias was serving there in the temple, there was a divine visitation. And in that divine visitation, Zachariah was told that he and his wife would bring forth a child. That child was John the Baptist. He was the forerunner for Jesus. I want to remind you that we can trust him and it's never too late. Oh, hallelujah. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we waited for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. Do you remember in the Old Testament the story of Hannah? Hannah was a lady believing God for a baby and she was barren. But one day as she prayed in the temple, she prayed with all of her might. See, we have to learn to pray effectual, fervent prayers. She prayed till there were no words coming out of her mouth. Only her lips were moving. But God heard the prayer from her heart. He answered Hannah. Oh, hallelujah. Sing it with me now. See what the Lord has done. Can you see what the Lord has done? What we waited for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your loving kindness. 
We thank you that you're not a God that you can lie. Lord God, what you have promised, you will make it good. Yes, you will. And I see what the Lord has done. Mine eyes have seen, mine ears have heard. I see what the Lord has done. What I've waited for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. You're awesome all by yourself. And I magnify you, Lord God. And I decree that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. It is you that maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And you leadeth me beside the still waters. You restoreth my soul, Lord God. I see what my Lord has done. Oh, hallelujah. Well, amen and amen. And once again, bless the Lord, saints. He's worthy to be praised. And there is no God like our God. This is Minister Pat Holmes coming to you once again from the secret place. And once again, decreeing the covenant blessings of the Lord upon you and your household, every situation and circumstance that pertains to you. Remember what the psalmist David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Glory to God. David let us know in that psalm how the Lord, how the shepherd loves us. Continue to trust him. Where I am going to jump immediately into the Bible study, I have been so blessed. It was a couple of weeks ago that the Lord dropped a phrase in my heart and it kept recycling itself. And the phrase was from the book of Genesis. And this is what it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. You'll probably hear that phrase several times tonight. I knew immediately what he was talking about, what Bible story he was referring to, and you will too as soon as I open up this picture. You know that this picture depicts Father Abraham and his covenant son Isaac. And I'm so glad they pictured Isaac here as a grown man because he was a grown man. This depicted the covenant that Father God and Jesus would cut on our behalf on Mount Moriah thousands of years later. But here is a type and a shadow, a father and a willing son. Jehovah God, a father, and Jesus, his willing son, who died on the cross on Mount Moriah. We know that Isaac was not sacrificed. This was just a type and shadow pointing to Jesus. Jesus does not receive human sacrifices. In Satan's kingdom, they do. But that phrase, I want to get to that, in the Mount of the Lord. It shall be seen. You're going to hear that several times again. Let's pull up page one and show you where this scripture can be found. And we're here in Genesis 22 and verse 13. And it reads like this. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Now I want to stop right there and pause. He lifted up his eyes and looked. It is so very important, not only to lift up your eyes, but it's important to look. Look there in the middle of the page and see the meaning of the word looked. It means to look at. It means to inspect, perceive, and consider. All that we would look up, look at, inspect perceive and consider. This is how God downloads revelation knowledge into the bride of Christ. So when Abraham looked up, we're going back to the scripture, verse 13 at the top, and it says, of course, and he looked, he says, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering 
in the stead of his son. Again, this was a type and shadow of Jehovah God and his only begotten son, Jesus. So because Abraham looked up, because he looked, see an angel came and the voice of the angel was released. We're talking about prophetic vision, prophetic illumination, prophetic revelation. This is how God talks to his bride. He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will have vision. This all has to do with the prophetic flow. In the book of Revelation it teaches us that the testimony of the Lord is the spirit of prophecy. That is what moves and flows through the bride of Christ. Are you flowing with the spirit of prophecy? Looking up Focusing in on perceiving, considering, understanding, and beholding. This is how God talks and releases again divine revelation. As we go on down the outline, we look at verse 14. And it says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Oh, glory to God. Let me stop and break down. The word Jehovah means self-existing one. Self-existing one. Our God needs no party to prop him up. <laughs> Glory to God. He is the self-existing one. And the word gyra means provider. That phrase came from this incident in the mount where Abraham went to sacrifice his only covenant son whose name was Isaac. Abraham is the one that called him Jehovah Jireh. The self-existing one provides. And it really carries this meaning. He sees and he provides. Think about it. He sees what you're going through. He's the self-existing one. And he provides because you belong to him. Now let's read the rest of this. Uh, we're again, we're in verse 14 and it continues on. It says, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord. It shall be seen. Oh, I like that. In the mount of the Lord. Who shall ascend into the presence of the Lord? The psalmist said. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Nor sworn deceitfully. See, not everybody can ascend up into the presence and hear. Not everybody can he communicate with on this level. Because he said he that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. This is why we have to get in the presence of the Lord and repent and ask him to use his Holy Ghost detergent and wash us out. Now I'm going to go to conversation between the prophet Jeremiah and Jehovah God. You remember Jeremiah was a young man when God called him into the office of a prophet. He wanted nothing to do with it. And the reason being, the prophets were so mistreated. If the people didn't get a prophetic word that they liked, they would go against the prophet. And the same thing goes on today. And Jeremiah was telling God, I'm too young. I don't want to be bothered with that. And the Lord began to tell him that he had called him. And God let him know that I will strengthen your forehead. Because you were, he was going to have to be a strong man, a man of a strong constitution to deal with a rebellious nation. And so it is today. They still stone the prophets. Back then, with real stones. Now with the words from our mouths. Oh my God. But those that have an ear to hear. Will look up. Perceive. Understand. Hear the word of the Lord. And follow his direction. So as God begins to talk to Jeremiah. You look at verse 11. You're going to love this. And it says. Uh, Moreover the word of the Lord. Came unto me saying. Jeremiah. What seest thou? Oh, we're putting emphasis on vision tonight. What seest thou? And then Jeremiah answered. He said, and I said, I see a rod of, I, yeah, I see a rod of an almond tree. Now, I have a depiction of that that I want to show you 
uh, what he saw, the rod of the almond tree. It's right here. And uh, we see they the, the artist put emphasis on the rod, but that's what the story is about. And you see Jeremiah depicted there seated on the ground. So God is showing him this in a vision. What do you see? I see the rod of an almond tree. And God let him know rightfully so. And he began to release a prophetic word concerning an incident or situation that would occur there in Israel amongst God's chosen people. And he was letting the prophet Jeremiah know the timing because the almond tree was one of the first trees to bud. So Jeremiah knew that when he saw that in the vision, he knew the approximate time that the incident would occur. This is how God talks in visions, in revelation knowledge. He will show you things that you are familiar with and you and God will begin to converse together. Now we go up on the outline. He's still talking to Jeremiah. Look at verse 13 and it says and the word of the Lord came unto me the second time saying what seest thou God wants us to be a people of vision glory to God I want you to know vision is different from regular sight what seest thou and I see it I see a seething pot and the face thereof towards the north let me show you a depiction of that I found a picture of a seething pot. You remember the pots were used in the tabernacle and in the temple when they would uh, uh, sac sacrifice the animals and then they would cook different things in the pot. It had to be cooked and then presented up before the Lord. Some of it cooked, some of it was on the burnt altar, as you know. But this was a seething pot that was used in the tabernacle. And this pot's mouth was turned towards the north. Now, I think I just read it in the New King James, and it said the face of the pot. But in the regular King James, the mouth of the pot was turned towards the north. So when Jeremiah mentioned that, I, I see this pot, and the face of it is turned this way, God began to speak to him, let him know, you have rightly seen, and out of the north there shall come an invading army. So when he looked up, Jeremiah, when he perceived, when he considered he had understanding, God began to release a revelatory word to him. That's the same God that you and I serve. We go down on the outline to Jeremiah 24 and verse 3. We see the same phrase. He says, Then said the Lord unto me, what seest thou? And in this particular uh, scripture, Jeremiah mentioned about how he saw some rotten fruit as well as some good fruit. Does that not go on now, even in the body of Christ? And the Lord began to give him a prophetic word. I'm building up right now how God speaks, how he will speak, and then how he will deposit revelatory knowledge. We go here to Amos 7 and verse 8, and we see the same thing again. Amos is also a prophet. Listen to what God said to Amos. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? God wants us to see and perceive. We go down on the outline to Amos 8 and 2. Listen to it. And it says, and he said, Amos, what seest thou? We go down to Zechariah 4 and 2. And he said unto me, what seest thou? God want his bride to see. And walk synchronized with him, obeying him. We are also soldiers on the battlefield. And if soldiers can't see, how are they going to win the battle? We go down to Zechariah 5 and 2. You see it again. It says, and he said unto me, what seest thou? Again, people of vision. Let me pull this page off. Believe it or not, I only have four pages tonight. I can't believe it myself. And let me see. Oh, I have some more at the bottom of this page. This is page two already. And I have right here, a note to myself, reference my personal testimony. I want you to know how God will let you know things in advance, very similar to that, where he would just show you a picture of something. And then once you lock eyes on that, he will begin to develop a revelatory word to go with it. It was many years ago. I've, I've shared this with the Bible story several times, but I'm going to share this. It was many years ago. We had had a death uh, in 
in my family and some flowers were, were sent to my home uh, just uh, let, let me know that they were praying for me. And uh, one night I'm, I'm seated there in, 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 in my living room and I, I was looking at those flowers just thanking God that somebody would remember and be a blessing to me. And the Spirit of the Lord began to speak. It was kind of like Jeremiah uh, letting me know what those flowers represented. I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment. But I, I was brand new at this. I didn't quite have an understanding and that phrase came to me that we've heard people say so many times you're so spiritually minded you're no earthly good see it's, it's amazing how the devil will start in on you early to rob you of conversations with the Lord but he was dropping this in my spirit about this flower and he said get up and cut the head saw and there were three let me show you this flower and right by it and uh, my sister, when she sees this picture and this teaching, she'll be jumping for joy. <laughs> I'm not really jumping for joy. She'll see it. But these are this is the flower over on the left, and it just now came to me. I think this is called the closet flower. I think. I think it's called the closet flower. But I'm in the living room. The flowers there is beautiful. It's green. And he tells me to get up and cut that. It was three of them. Cut those heads off. And I did, and he began to let me know about a battle, that a confrontation that would be coming. And over here to the right, when I was in the living living room that night, the Lord spoke to me that it represented a hooded cobra. And you know when a cobra is hooded, it's ready to strike. And he told me, cut it off, nip it right now. And I knew as I was doing that in the natural, God was doing something in the realm of the spirit. Oh, and if I could tell you what preceded behind that. But you know, some testimonies, we can't tell all of it because this was family stuff. But there were three individuals. But thank God he brought peace in the midst of a storm did come. He brought some peace in the midst of the storm, but I'm so thankful that he gave me a warning ahead of time. That's all I can share on that. Let me fast forward and share another personal testimony. How God will show you an image, have you focus in, lock in, perceive, and consider, and how he will drop a revelatory word. Years ago, and I've told this one several times to the Bible study, when my daughter was graduating from high school. Of course, every year the high school uh, young people have a prom. And they had a theme for the prom and it was the Phantom of the Opera. Now see, in the natural if you just look, but you don't perceive what's going on and what the threat is, oh my goodness, you can lose the battle. So this was the cutout that they used in all of those prom pictures. So when her prom pictures came to me, and I'm observing the prom pictures, and there was a pedestal by her in that uh, prom picture, and on that pedestal was this, this mask that you see below. Still, I'm new in all of this, but the Spirit of the Lord began dealing with me in my spirit to take a authority over the spirit of death. Well, here I go, Miss Know-it-all. I'm arguing with the Lord. Oh, that's just the, the theme that those young people chose for their uh, for their prom. There's absolutely nothing to that, or to that. Oh, my God. But have I learned now through the years what we're looking at and perceiving in the natural can carry heavy weight in the realm of the spirit. And again, he told me, take authority over the spirit of death. And I'm so glad I did. I started off reluctantly thinking you are just too far out there. Oh my God. But what I did on that night, what I spoke on that night would carry weight up the road when the devil would come to kill that same daughter whose prom theme was this phantom of the opera. Phantom has to do with the ghost. And this is the theme that they use. And the Lord let me know it was symbolic of the spirit of death that would be tracking her heel. I'm glad I took authority over it because a couple of years later where there were there been quite a few attacks. Uh, the enemy has had on her life because she's a chosen vessel. All of our children are chosen of the Lord to do great and mighty things. So some years later, she's now in college. She has her first brand new car. I'm trying to get this off of here. She has her first brand new car and um, 
she's going somewhere and suddenly uh, she loses control of the car and the car tumbles down a hill and when uh, we talked to the uh, police they they everybody was surprised that she survived that there was no way in the natural she should have survived that and she got out of that wreckage the car landed up on a tree some kind of way because the insurance had to pay for the tree that's how I know about that and she opened the door and jumped out of that car and when they called that day uh, the police department from where she was in Oklahoma and I uh, heard the news all I could do was just sit down and say thank you Jesus and he took me back to the night when he told me to take authority over the spirit of death. See, this is why we have to be a people that will look up, look up on, perceive, consider, and understand. Well, after that, I stopped arguing with the Lord when he dropped something. Now, in my spirit, I try to quickly obey. I want to look here on the outline, and you see where it says, reference Moses. I think I've gotten it really big. But anyway, you see that highlighted in yellow. And it says, reference Moses. And I have there, when he saw the burning bush. You all remember that? And it says when he had an encounter with God. It was because, because Moses observed that burning bush. Moses stopped, if you remember, looked on the burning bush and what uh, attracted him to that burning bush there at the back of the desert, the bush the fire would not go out. And they said it was a common thing for bushes to catch on fire out there in that, that hot desert. It was a common thing. But normally the bushes would go out right away. This bush kept burning. And it got Moses' attention. And when he looked on that bush, if you remember, God began to speak to Moses, reveal the plan of God for Moses. We're talking about in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Oh, glory to God. Let me go over to the next page here. I told you we only have four pages that I mentioned that. And I believe this is page three if I haven't mixed anything up. We're talking about vision and sight. And in the mount of the Lord, it shall be perceived. But listen to this because there are so many who haven't heard teaching of this type. And it leaves us without knowledge how the king of the kingdom operates. Trying to pull that page over, but I'm going to leave it right there. We're on page three, and this is Hosea. We're all familiar with this scripture. Chapter four and verse six. And it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's coming to me right now. Do you remember when God's chosen people were down in Egypt? And you remember the word of the Lord that came through Moses, who was also a prophet, telling them to uh, gird their feet, their shoes on their feet, get their staff in their hand, put blood over the doorpost. Not everybody heard that word. That was a word for God's chosen people. And Moses let them know, Jehovah has said, tonight, you're coming out of here. What have they not obeyed? This is why it's so important to be tuned in and hear what thus says the Lord. Oh, glory to his name. I was thinking of that song. I could just hear that in my mind. I'm bound for Mount Zion, a city on a hill. If anybody make it, surely I will. See, we got to be in tune to God. The people, we are the people of Mount Zion. So again, listen to what the prophet Hosea said. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Oh my God, I will reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. Now we know even in the New Testament, the Bible calls us priests and kings. And the priests are the ones that served in the tabernacle, took care of the holy things of God, the revelatory things of God, the priests. And so if we're going to serve in the office of the priest, we're going to have to be tuned in. We're going to have to look up and consider. So it goes on to say here in Hosea, he's saying, Sin, thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. 
I will also forget thy children. I want to introduce you here to the nature of God. As I've said, oftentimes, sometimes in the New Covenant, the New Testament, we hear all of the greasy grace teaching, the name it and the claim it. One preacher said, blab it and grab it. And we focus on that. But God wants us to know him. Oh, my God. And he tells them right here again, say, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We can only get knowledge when we press in to the things of God. We're not going to get it off of these uh, TV shows. The Erica King, I guess she's still on the show. I don't know. I can't think of the name of any of those. But those uh, soap operas. You're not going to get revelation knowledge there. And as these days approach, we will, as they are upon us, not approach even now, we need to hear from the mount. Again, our subject tonight was in the mount it shall be seen. It was when Abraham and Isaac ascended up that mount that they had conversation with God. It's when we ascend into the presence of the Lord and to his mount and to his presence. The psalmist said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help is actually a question, but we read it all together. So he says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hill. From whence cometh my help? Where does my help come from? So he already knows it's to the hill. My help cometh from the Lord. Pressing in to him and seeking his face, seeking his information. We go on down. Uh, there's another scripture I wanted to quote. I don't see it, but I'm just going to quote it. And we know it. It may be on here somewhere. But it says, where there is no vision. Anybody remember that? Where there is no vision, the people perish. We have to be people of vision, not just sight. Let's look at this that I have highlighted in yellow. Oh, now this is part of what started this outline. God so blessed me with this concerning the ten virgins. I have preached on the ten virgins for years. And I have put emphasis on the fact that five were foolish and they did not have enough oil. That's normally where my emphasis is. A couple of weeks ago, the Lord brought that back to me. And he said, the, op the absence of oil also means absence of sight for the night. You remember the bridegroom, it was their custom to come at night and to summon the bridal party together and they all had to be ready. The bridemaids, they had to have their garments close by. They had to have that lantern because he would come at night and the bridal party would meet out in the street and then the bridegroom and his groomsmen, they would lead them, uh, lead everybody to where that wedding would take place. It's a type and shadow depicting when I our bridegroom will come. He will come in the night. Oh my God. And we're going to have to rise up to meet him. Now does that mean night in the natural? A night season in the land. Well either one of them applies. Because we're definitely in night season in the land. So here we can read that story. I didn't put it up here. But it's in Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13. And I just wrote what he gave me. Uh, the absence of oil meant absence of sight for the night and beneath that i have no light for the night and i tell you we need light we need oil that's symbolic of the Holy Ghost dwelling within us. And we need to keep ourselves furbished with the oil of the Holy Ghost. And you can only do that when you get in the presence of the Lord. When you're seeking Him, you're worshiping Him, you're loving Him, you're reading His Word, you're listening to teaching of the Word, the expounding of the Word. The psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So this is how we keep ourselves supplied with oil. But you remember in this story, there were ten virgins. The Bible calls five of them foolish and five of them wise. The five foolish virgins, when the bridegroom finally showed up and they were all summoned to meet him out there in the, seat, in the street and proceed to the wedding, they didn't have any oil. That meant they didn't have enough light to guide them in the night. And as you go on and read that story, it's so sad. It brings out that they had to go and get oil there at the last minute. But by the time they made it to the wedding, the door had already been shut. And they could not enter in. 
pause and think about that. Now that right there will cause you to shake inside. We cannot play with this thing. We have to keep ourselves, our lamps filled with oil so that we can have light in the midst of the night season. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to read here a couple of scriptures dealing with darkness. Uh, we're going to start right there with Matthew 6 and verse 23. And it says, let me blink my eyes and get them cleared up here. But if thine eye be evil, it says thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Think about that. If your eye is evil. So many people have not asked the Lord to purge and cleanse their hearts. If your eye be evil, then it says your whole body shall, shall be full of darkness. He says, there, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? We go on down to the next verse we're dealing with darkness again and it says uh, the light of the body is the eye therefore when thine eye is single thy whole body is also full of light <clears throat> but when thine eye is evil thy body also is full of darkness so you have to determine that the only way we can get rid of the evil inside and even evil sight we have to be washed by the blood of the lamb we have to ask God to remove the old scales off for our eyes do you remember the apostle Paul I'm going to mention him in a minute when I get ready to close but right now it's coming to me when he had that experience on on the Damascus Road. Remember, he was blinded, and remember, it's, the scripture said it was it's as if scales were on his eyes, and uh, that is exactly how it is when we're in the world. So many think because of their degrees. <laughs> Oh my God, I could get on that. And there are hookups in the educational arena of what status they are in their life, on their jobs and so forth. They think they have light and they don't even know the Lord. You can't have light, not that kind of light, until you ask him to forgive you of your sins, wash you in his blood and remove the scales from your eyes. There are many that are going to be deceived and saddened on that day. Now let me read this. I have there in the NLT, the New Living Translation. Listen to what it says. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Now that makes it real plain. Make sure that the light that you think you have is not actually darkness. See, when you're hooked up with all of these Masonic groups and taking all of these secret vows and, and uh, making these secret covenants and, and they teach them there about the light that they have. They have entered into the light. They have great darkness. And when you have sworn allegiance to another God, because as you study the ones who have been in that and came out of that, and the Lord removed the scales off of their eyes, they will tell you the secret things, and it's Satan's bondage. That is all that it is. Satan's bondage leading them away from a true relationship with the Lord. We're actually down to page four. Can you believe that? So here on page uh, four, I think I didn't read part of it. Uh, let me see what I got here. Uh, I got it on mine. Okay, that is just explaining at the top about the deception that you're in when scales are over your eyes. All of these sororities and fraternities and these allegiances that they have made to the Greek gods, those are chains that are holding them bound in Satan's prison. And the only way to get released from that is to acknowledge, to repent, to look up and to look up on. Oh, glory to God. And God will provide true light. But many want to straddle the sense fence and do both. We go here now to, what is that, Joshua 7 and 21 on the page. Uh, yeah, Joshua 7 verse 21. I want to mention this story. Most of us will remember Achan. And I'm going to tell the story and I'll read that also. But you remember when Joshua 
uh, they went to fight the Battle of Jericho. And they had won a major battle the day before. Remember the walls fell down when Joshua and those soldiers walked around that wall and the walls just fell down. It was a big major city. Well, the next day they were going to do a mop-up cleanup service. I, I, I spoke concerning a mission mop-up a few weeks ago. So they were going to do a mop-up service and all that, uh, the, that, that was left over, soldiers that were left over that had hit now, they were going to take care of them and mop up the city. Well, all of a sudden, they lost that battle. And it was very, a very small battle compared to what they had done the day before. So Joshua got before the Lord and he looked up. See, I'm so glad we can come to God and we can talk to God. And God told him, get up, get up off your face. He said, there is an accursed thing in the camp. Oh my goodness. See, you can't bring accursed items in the camp, as I said before. Some of these things that people are involved in and sitting on church benches, that is a curse before the Lord because you've made allegiance with another God. So God tells him, Joshua, to get up. There's an accursed thing in the camp. And Joshua goes throughout the camp dealing with the soldiers that went and finally they came to Achan. If you remember, you know what his name means? Troubler. Because he troubled the camp. And he finally admitted what he had done. And we're going to read it right there. Joshua's talking to him. And Ethan acknowledges. He says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment. See, we're talking about sight and vision. His sight saw a beautiful Babylonian garment. And when I studied on it years ago, it was talking about all the beautiful embroidery on it and how beautiful it was. But God had already told them, don't touch anything in that accursed city. But he stole that garment and some silver and some gold, and he hid it in his tent. You remember the story. And by him hiding that item in the tent, in the camp of God's chosen people, it brought a curse. That's why they lost the battle the day before, because of him. Now, we're talking about sight. You see what he said? When I saw, when I saw. And then he goes on to say, uh, let me start right there with garment. He said, and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Listen to this. I have it underlined. Then I coveted them. Oh, my goodness. He says, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the middle of my tent. And the silver, let me see, under it. So he had hidden all of those accursed items in his tent. God had given specific instruction, but he did it his way, just like many are doing now. And we know the story. Because of that, he was stoned to death and also his family. And the word iniquity is used in that. I've talked about the word iniquity many times. Iniquity is sin, but it is a sin that is so strong and it it has the ability to travel down the family tree from generation to generation. So God was stamping out iniquity, saying, I don't want rebellion in my camp. When I tell you what to do, do that. But he said, when I saw, and we're going to bring out in this next scripture about what we were warned about by John, the apostle, the one that wrote the book of Revelation. I have here, you see where it says Adam and Eve, same thing. It says Adam and Eve seduced by the lust of the eyes, then the lust of the flesh, and finally the pride of life. That is in John, 1 John 2 and verse 16. John tells us the things that are in the world, the things that will entrap us, they are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we remember Adam and Eve, our mom and dad, when that snake was talking to them, well, they began to look up on that, that fruit, on that forbidden tree, the tree of life. They were told not to eat the fruit from that. So the lust of the flesh, they desired, they desired that fruit. And then, of course, the lust of the eyes. Satan just began to deceive them in that uh, conversation and say, no, God didn't mean that. You know, he knows that if you eat of that fruit, then you shall be enlightened. You shall be as a God. And they were listening to all of this. And then, of course, the pride of life with him telling them they would be as a God. <clears throat> and we know the story. They ate the fruit and they brought a curse upon the land. Let me get some of this. We're dealing with 
sight versus vision. Their sight messed them up. Had they had the true vision of the Lord, they would have stuck with that and honored what God had said. <laughs> We're actually here at the end of the page, but this one is so powerful. You see uh, Mark 8 and 23. Excuse me, do we all remember this story? This is an interesting story because it's the only time in Scripture where it records Jesus had to lay hand twice on an individual to get him healed. And I don't know he didn't have to do it, but he did this for a reason. Let's look at this. I got to get another sip of this tea. Oh. Some kind of frog <coughs> would come in my throat right now. Let's look at this. And we are in Mark 8 and verse 23. And it says, So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had put on, when he had spit on his eyes, <coughs> spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Now, this is Jesus laying hands on the blind man's eye. Do you see anything? And listen to what the blind man said. Excuse me for coughing. You know when that itch gets in your throat? Oh, my goodness. You just got to cough it out. <coughs> and we go to verse 24. And it says, he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. So we see the vision wasn't clear. The man said, even though you laid hands on me, on my eyes, I see men, they look like trees. <laughs> They're walking. And look at this. I love this story. Verse 25. And it says, then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. That right there depicts the need of a touch. We need a second touch. If we're not seeing, if we're not perceiving prophetically, and I'm going to call them conversations from the throne room of God, prophetic releases from the throne room of God, and it's not just for our family, but concerning the church, <laughs> concerning the land and the political upheaval that our land is in, God will deal with us in all phases. He said heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, we are the bride of Christ. He releases information as to groom to us so that we can receive march in order, so that we will know how to pray in accordance with what heaven is saying. But when we just look right here with natural sight, that is not the same as divine vision. And this last reference I want to make, you see the last two uh, lines right there. I have referenced the Apostle Paul. He received a vision after he lost his sight. I laugh when I got that because you remember Paul was so smart. Paul had so many degrees. Oh my goodness. And he was the one that had been deputized to go and find the Christians and arrest them. He was a bounty hunter. And many people were hurt as a result of Paul the bounty hunter. And some died. And there he was walking around with all these degrees. Oh my goodness. But all he had was sight. He didn't have divine vision. But we know when the Lord visited him on that road, and after that conversation, the Lord asked him, Why kick ye against the prick? When you, Paul, or Saul was his name at that time, when you are kicking against my people, mistreating my people, and doing the things that you're doing to my people, you're kicking against me. That is exactly what God was saying. And during that visitation, Saul was his name at that time. He lost his natural sight. But he had that vision. He knew he had met the Lord. Matter of fact, he answered, Lord, isn't that funny? All of a sudden, he would know who he was, the one that he had fought against. So we know the story. He was taken to Cornelius's house. I think it was Cornelius. Ananias. It was either Ananias or Cornelius. I think Cornelius. But he was taken to the house and the Lord spoke to Cornelius, if I have the name right. And he let him know that uh, he wasn't taken to Cornelius' house. He was taken to a house, to Simon the Tanner's house, on a street. And the name of the street was called Straight. So he speaks to Cornelius, who was at his own house, and says to him, I want you to go to the house of Simon the Tanner. There's one in there. His name is Saul. He is blind. He has seen a vision. 
that you will come and lay hands on him and he will receive his sight. You see why visions are so very important. And sure enough, Cornelius, after arguing with God, he was like, don't you know who that man is? Don't you know the damage that man has done? Don't you know the history of that man? I can't stand that man. God said, go, because he's my chosen vessel. I want to say see law. Pause and think about it. Some of the same ones that we crucify. Don't you see that drunk over there? Don't you see that drug addict over there? Don't you see that, that trafficker, that sex trafficker over there? It's not that we are to deny that all of that is evil and all that is wrong. But as the bride of Christ with vision, we need to be praying a release for these individuals. Many are chosen vessels, just like Saul was. We know that he was healed. He got set free. He began to seek the Lord. He began to fast. He began to pray. And he was the one that was used by the Holy Ghost to pen, to write two-thirds of the New Testament. The one that everybody had counted as dumb was the one that the Lord used. This is why we, the bride of Christ, have to seek him. in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. In the presence of the Lord, it shall be seen. Father, we thank you for the teaching of this word. And Lord, even now, as you did for Saul on that day, you remove the scales off of his eyes. We ask that you remove the scales off of our eyes. We ask that you circumcise our heart. Move away, Lord God, the fleshly coverings that would hinder the imparting of the Holy Ghost and things from on high, things from the Master table. Lord, we want to be sheep that are seated at your table, even as David preached in that song. Lord God, there's a table that you have prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. There are enemies, many enemies in the land, but you want your children to sit at your table. Father, we pray that this night, Lord God. We just ask that you get us in order and that we will be used to do mighty exploits in your name in this day and time. This is Minister Pat Holmes signing off from the secret place. And until next time, I want to say shalom, which means peace.